National College of Dentists is an honorary organization composed of dentists from throughout the world. The USA section of the college decided to record visually not only the history of the college, but also several leaders in our profession. Dr. H. O. Westerdahl, Secretary General Emeritus of the college, was selected as the outstanding individual to be honored with the first videotape. The purpose of these tapes is to recognize those people who have contributed significantly to the dental profession. How great it would be if we had G.V. Black on an audiovisual tape. Wouldn't it be wonderful to bring back Pierre Fouchard, the father of modern dentistry? Another purpose of this project of the college is to explore the qualities of leadership. What makes good leaders? What qualities lead them to the top? And what can we and future generations learn from them? This program in the series of the Chronicles of Outstanding Leaders in Dentistry highlights the career of Clifton Dummett. Dr. Dummett is interviewed by Dr. Richard Adelson. Um, at, a, at a nice place to begin, which is the beginning. Uh -huh. um, um, I noticed when I was reading your biography that you came from British Guyana, came to this country uh, at around the age of 17. That's right. That's Tell me right. a little bit about that. All right. Uh, yes, my home country is British Guyana. Uh, it, was, it is one of the three Guyanas in South America. They're British, French, and Dutch. It's on the northeastern coast of South America, just above Brazil. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that time, it was the only British colony in uh, South America. And um, the tendency was for the whole life in Guyana to be patterned after the British system. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was born there in 1919 and uh, was there up until 1936 when I first came to the United States. And you came directly to this country? Came directly to the United States, that's right. What, mm -hmm. was, what was the reason for that? My interest has always been in dentistry. My father was a dentist, a British dentist, oh. uh, one of the, the old timers. Uh, this was before they had uh, uh, the essential business of going to dental school. My father was a, was a registered chemist and druggist. And there was an American dentist, a Dr. Rogers, who came to Guyana to practice for a while. And he and dad got together, they seemed to like each other, and my dad was apprenticed to him. And after he had been with uh, Rogers for some years, uh, he could take the, the, the local examination and uh, practice as a dentist. So this, is, this was my relationship, this was my indoctrination to dentistry. Now, did the whole family come to this country? or was it just No, no, just, just, just me. Just and me. and well, why the U.S. and not Britain? Because Dad felt that the United States had the best dental training in the world. He was always impressed with American dentistry. And he insisted that it was either going to be dentistry in the United States or not at all. As a matter of fact, the tendency was for all of the, the young kids in Guyana to go over to England for further work. The physicians and lawyers and businessmen all went to England to be trained. But somehow, dentistry was always looked upon as being uh, the best hair in the United States. So Dad insisted, that, and I suppose part of it was due to his contact with Dr. Rogers too. He insisted that since I had always wanted to be a dentist, that I would have to come to the United States. And uh, as you know, in those days, the tendency was not like today. When Dad said it, that was the last word, you see. <laughs> <laughs> if Dad said it, Clifton is going That's to the United right. States. <laughs> That's uh. right. So I came over here in 1936, and I went to uh, Howard University in Washington, and I was there for two years taking my pre-dental work. And at the end of that time, uh, because of my good friend, incidentally, this is another interesting story. It's a little bit long. But when I came over to the United States, I had a very good friend, a schoolmate of mine, who was a young man of, of Indian descent. He was an East Indian. And his name was Teddy Jagan. And I don't know whether that name rings a bell with you. 
at any rate, uh, we were in college together. And when I decided to come to the United States to study dentistry, he decided to come along with me. Uh, we, unfortunately, his uh, uh, parents were not in a position to uh, help him financially, so he had to work. So he came over to the United States and he worked in Washington, and this was how he was able to put himself through uh, pre-dental. But at the end of two years, he felt that uh, he would be able to do much better from a financial standpoint in a city like Chicago. So he promptly applied to Northwestern University, was accepted and decided to migrate from Washington to Chicago. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to go along with him, and I, of course, said at that time, uh, I had no, no compunctions about it, but I doubted that Dad would want me changing schools uh, at will. So he says, well, not, why not ask Dad? So I said, no, you know how Dad is. He's very definitive. So the long and short of it was that uh, he wrote to my dad. Dad wrote back saying that uh, it was up to me to move wherever I wanted to. So I promptly got busy and applied to Northwestern. And of course, because my record was very good, there was no difficulty, mm -hmm. and I was accepted in the Northwestern. So we both moved up to Northwestern I at the see. same time. I mentioned his name because years later, he became, I remained in the United States, he went back to Guyana, and he became the first prime minister. Isn't that interesting? Of Guyana, ah. that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and he's the one who wrote your dad. He, that's he right. already had that's diplomatic right. skills, I guess. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Let me write. Incidentally, there's a change in name, too. Uh, under the colonial system, it was G-U-I-A-N-A, -A, British Guyana. Mm -hmm. When the country became independent, they dropped the British and changed the spelling to G-U-Y-A-N-A. -A. And that's mm -hmm. how it is known now, Guyana. Had you ever thought about another career besides dentistry? I never did, no, no. Uh, Dad was always thought I was rather consistent with that because as a young fellow, I used to play around with the plaster and I remember even tr uh, trying to make an impression on one of the mouths of my uh, young friends. And of course, the plaster uh, set very hard. And <laughs> <laughs> did, did no, but I was always in. interested in dentistry, yes. Dad yeah. had to come in and extricate well, right. the kid that's from right. the plaster. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, no, my interest has always been in dentistry, and I have absolutely no regrets. If I had it to do all over again, it would be exactly the way that it happened, in so uh, far as I'm concerned. And, and yet you didn't go back to Guyana? No. No. Uh, and the reason for that is, is, is very, very simple. Uh, uh, I had always been interested in teaching, research, administration. Now, there is really and truly no outlet for that sort of thing in Guyana. There's no dental school uh, in Guyana. And uh, uh, after I, I graduated, which was in 1941, I uh, decided to take some graduate work in Perio, which was really and truly my interest. And in the meanwhile, I uh, started to make some arrangements about uh, staying in the United States. Uh, this was relatively easy for me because of the fact, and I, I, I have a special feeling about this, uh, most individuals who came to the United States were like Chedi. They had to work to put themselves through school. And as a matter of fact, most uh, of my classmates uh, did work in school, uh, you know, to help themselves through school. Uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, depending on how you look at it, I didn't have to work. My education was completely subsidized mm -hmm. by dad. And uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why I feel very strongly that um, uh, it was up to me to decide exactly what I wanted mm -hmm. to do with my life. So when I decided to become uh, a, a citizen, uh, there was absolutely no hesitation. I didn't feel that I, w I had to pay back anybody except Dad for having uh, subsidized uh, 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 my education. And at what point did you become a citizen? I became a citizen in 1946. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, in between then, you were still in school? No. In between then, after I graduated 
in 1941, I stayed on and uh, took the master's degree. That's right. Imperial. Now, uh, in this, on December the 7th, as you remember, was mm -hmm. World War II. And following the uh, entry of the United States into the World War II, I made an application to the Army at that time because this was another way of become, I thought, of becoming a citizen. Of course, that wasn't true, and I got a lovely letter from the Army at that time indicating that, one, uh, there were enough dental officers in the Army, two, that I was not a citizen, uh, and uh, suggested, three, that if I wanted to be involved in the conflict that I should volunteer for the British Army. And, of course, uh, that made my mind up to stay in the graduate program in Perio. Mm -hmm. In the meanwhile, I made some overtures to Howard University uh, with regards to a teaching appointment at the end of my graduate work. And uh, at that time, there was nothing available in periodontics. So then I made an application to Mahari. And uh, the president of the school, Dr. Edward L. Turner, at that time, wrote me back saying that uh, Mahari was undergoing a process of reorganization and that it would be entirely possible that uh, there would be a teaching appointment there after I would completed my graduate work. Well, uh, I did not know at the time, all of this is information that I found out mm -hmm. a little later on, that the person who was responsible for reorganizing the dental school at Mahari was a former president of the International College of Dentists. Is that right? A Dr. Marion Don Clausen. He was president in 1945. And I have a great deal of fondness for Dr. Clausen. He's, he's, I think of him as playing an important part in my life. In addition to the example that had been set to me, set for me by my dad, I think uh, Don Clausen was was a, a very fine man, a great man. Uh, he used to be the director of dental education at the American University in Beirut, Syria at that time. Beirut is now in Lebanon. Uh, but at that time, he was, uh, uh, as I said, Ameri the dental director of the American University. And the, the president of Meharry Turner used to be the medical director. They were colleagues. Turner came over and became president of Meharry. And for the reorganization of the dental school at Meharry, he asked Don Clausen to come over and assume that position. Don came over and became director of dental education at Meharry, and then decided to try to recruit individuals. And I was the first recruitment, recruit now, of his. Somewhere in there, you, you got your MPH from Michigan. Oh, no. No, that right. came much later. I see. That came later. OK. Because I came to Meharry in 1942 uh, as an instructor in periodontics and also to initiate the department of periodontics and to start some research. Some of these things hadn't, weren't being done I at see. Meharry. So I came there to start some of those things. And along with uh, uh, Clausen, we managed to uh, uh, get along very well as a, as a team. Uh, there's a long story uh, about this, which I, incidentally, I have recorded. Uh, and one of these days, I'm sure uh, I shall have it published. At any rate, uh, Clausen selected me as his deputy director of dental education. Mm -hmm. And uh, together, we were able to get uh, Meharry School of Dentistry fully approved by the Council on Dental Education when it started that program in 1944, 45, 46. And I always uh, tend to remind some of the big schools that when the council made its report uh, in 1945 in the Journal of Dental Education, uh, uh, Mahari was one of the 28 fully approved dental schools. Uh, so many of the other schools that we're familiar with became provisionally approved. And of course, that is always a point of great pride because I think uh, uh, Clausen did uh, uh, a wonderful job in his reorganization process, you see. Tell me what happened in 1947. 
In 47, okay. Now, in, in 46, okay. I went off to the University of Michigan on a Rosenwald Fellowship to take my master's degree in public health because I was always interested in public health too. Upon completion in 1947, and I came back to Meharry, uh, Don Clausen wanted me to be the dean of the School mm. of Dentistry. And uh, I accepted that uh, uh, deanship uh, with, a, with a proviso, and the proviso was that um, uh, the position of director of dental education, now this, as I said, goes into a complicated story. Meharry was in the South, and at that time there was a strong feeling that the, 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 the key positions in schools of medicine and dentistry should be under the jurisdiction of Caucasians. So at Meharry, we had the president, who was Caucasian, the director of medical education, who was mm -hmm. Caucasian, the dean of medicine, who was Afro-American, mm. the director of dental education, Clausen, Caucasian, the dean of dentistry, Afro-American, myself. The same thing happened with nursing education. I r had often disliked this arrangement, and I had mentioned this to Clausen on several occasions. Uh, but in as much as, as I said, we were very good friends, I decided to try this arrangement for a year, which I did. And at the end of that year, of course, I was not pleased with it at all. And so I gave Don an ultimatum that either uh, I would revert back to being professor of dentistry or else uh, I would be both dean and director of dental education or the director of dental education should be abolished completely. Well, we settled on my being both dean and director, and I was the only Afro-American that ever became a director of any medical, dental, or nursing education at Meharry. I see. And, and how did that eventually evolve? What that Well, uh, <clears throat> at the completion of my year as both dean and director, I resigned. Now the resignation was due to the so-called regional plan for education in the South. Here again, it was the peculiar pattern that was part and parcel of the South that uh, Afro-Americans and Caucasians could not go to school together. And uh, Meharry had always had problems of financial subsidy. So Don Clawson felt that one of the ways to, to keep Meharry in existence was to offer it as the quote-unquote Negro Medical Dental School, Negro Regional Medical and Dental School for the South. Hmm. Uh, now if this had happened maybe 10 or 12 years previously, it might have been a, a good ploy. But uh, it happened at a time when the Supreme Court had made a ruling that it was the responsibility of the southern states to educate all of the citizens, mm -hmm. all of the students within that state, so that it was a general impression that this regional plan was a means of allowing Meharry to circumvent the Supreme Court rulings. And it was on that basis that I refused to go along with it. And I said very definitely that if Meharry became the quote unquote segregated medical school of the South, then I could no longer uh, re remain there. And mm. of course, when it did become that in 1949, I promptly resigned. Oh. Interesting story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting mm -hmm. story. And, and what happened to you then? Then I went to the Veterans Administration Hospital at Tuskegee in Alabama. Oh. That too is an interesting story. Uh, uh, the assistant chief medical director for dentistry, Dr. Byron R. East, who was dean of Columbia University's dental school, he had been appointed as the assistant chief medical director for dentistry in 1946. And it was his 
responsibility to reorganize the dental service in the Veterans Administration, which had had its limitations. Well, Bayan was another forthright individual that uh, uh, made some changes that didn't make him the most popular person in the world. He stepped on a large number of toes, but for the short period of time that he was the ACMD, he did a marvelous job in upgrading dentistry in the VA. He introduced educational programs. He uh, introduced residency training programs, internship programs, insisted in, on mm -hmm. in-service education. Was just a, 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 a marvelous person. And how did the two of you get together? Okay. Uh, when he learned that I had resigned from Meharry, he called me long distance and wanted to know what were my plans. And I told him that I was uh, going up to Tufts University Dental School in Boston to work with another old friend of mine, Joe Volker, who was the dean at Tufts. Mm. Whereupon Bayan said, well, uh, uh, Cliff, uh, I think you've, you, you, you're mistaken because uh, Joe is going down to be the founding dean at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And I said, well, no, uh, I heard from him recently and he never mentioned that uh, to me. So he said, well, just a minute. And he got Joe Volker on the phone and we had a three-way conversation. And this was when I learned that uh, Volker was, was actually going into Alabama, but Joe told me, he says, well, Cliff, you don't have to worry. My successor there, Marshall Day, knows about your coming up to Tufts and there would be absolutely no problem, you know. I said, well, I wasn't interested in working with Marshall Day. I was interested in going to Tufts to work with you. Uh, so, Bayan East then suggested that since Joe was going as the new dean at Alabama, that uh, one of the ways of improving the services at the Tuskegee VA Hospital would be utilizing all of Joe's faculty members as consultants. And that, of course, sold me on that. I went down to Tuskegee, where the, 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 the dental service was really um, very, very, very limited. And with the help of Joe Volker and the support of the manager of the hospital there, Dr. T.T. T. Tilden, along with Bionese mm -hmm. support, we were able to, um, to turn the dental service around. And as a matter of fact, it became one of the, uh, the, the, the showcases of VA dentistry. And we introduced a large number of educational programs. And uh, 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 I think it was generally acknowledged that VA Tuskegee Dental Service was really and, and so you were then both chief of the dental services at Tuskegee as well as a faculty member at the University of Alabama. That came later on. That came in 1964. Uh -huh. In 1964, yes, I was appointed again with uh, uh, Dr. Volker's uh, uh, knowledge and support as the first Afro-American faculty member at the University uh -huh. of Alabama. And this was the time when uh, the governor was standing in the door, you know, yes, about the right. students. Yes, right. Oh. <laughs> and you've been right at the front of every piece yes. of excitement. Yes. Well, Joe Volker, I think, is, is one of dentistry's uh, great men, as is his uh, successor, one of his successors, uh, Scotty McCollum, who is now Vice President for Health Affairs. Mm -hmm. Scotty was one of the residents at the University of Alabama that used to come down to Tuskegee, too, at the time. Spend time with you. So we've got a, a, a long list of friends and associates in that area. Mm -hmm. When you look back at those years at Tuskegee, uh -huh. is, is there anything that stands out as a special accomplishment? Yes. I would say that uh, the, the, um, the 1952 Institute of Public Health in the South, I really feel that that was one of the premier accomplishments uh, uh, while I was down there. And uh, that again was supported by Dr. Bayan East. What happened was this, that um, I had felt that there was a need to meld the skills and the services of the various professional groups in, a, in an assault on the public health problems of the South. 
And I felt the starting point would be getting various uh, uh, top-notch individuals to come together and discuss some of these problems, not only dental, but medical and nursing and nutritional and all the rest of it. So I organized this uh, Institute of Public Health in which I used Dr. Howard Odom, who was one of the nation's outstanding sociologists from the University of North Carolina. And I used him as the centerpiece and then brought in uh, uh, outstanding physicians, outstanding public healthers. John Hanlon was at the University of Michigan, uh, Zachary Stadt. And this was like a think tank that you... Exactly, oh. exactly. Uh, not, only, not only that, but we also had them at a, at a, at a huge conference whereby, whereby we invited a large number of people in the area. And uh, for some reason or other, I suppose the, 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 the the scope of the conference seemed to uh, have attracted the, the AP and the UP and the international press. And we had uh, stories about the conference being published throughout the nation. It was mm -hmm. very, very, very well covered. And uh, the American Public Health Association asked us the following year to make a report on this conference. We had about, uh, oh good heavens, 3,000 people that attended and it was really a magnificent thing and of course the important thing was that the conference was spearheaded by a dentist mm. and this was also most unusual because you know how the physicians have felt right. traditionally about about us but we happened to get the cooperation of everybody and i think the fact that it was well recognized was responsible for the the, 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 the total support in making the conference as outstanding as it was and what was the spin-off of that? Well, uh, I do honestly believe that it, uh, it, it helped in, the, in pushing the, the separate frontiers back. As a matter of fact, uh, it was the first time that we had got people of different races coming together in a non-segregated uh, fashion and discussing these basic problems, discussing why uh, we had to consider the health of all peoples at the same mm. time. We couldn't separate them into Negro health and white health mm. and Indian mm. health, but we had to tackle the problems of the health of people mm. and uh, garner the forces and the abilities of all of the various mm. professional groups working together to improve the health of the American people. And you got them together in Tuskegee. In, in Tuskegee. Yes. And this was a time, you know, 1952, and yes. it was still, uh, the racial situation was still very mm. difficult. So I have a special feeling for that first mm. public health institute, and I oh. also published the proceedings of it, too. Mm. Oh, that, that's mm. super. Mm. And then you had a, um, you continued then with the VA up until the time that you... That went, you went to the military? Uh, yes. In 1955, 1955, I sent in an application to the Air Force because I had always felt that in as much as I was a naturalized citizen that uh, I should have some indication of my desire to serve in the armed forces. Hmm. So I applied and uh, I was given a commission and uh, as you know with the military they ask you where you wanted to go. And of course, I had several places, particularly because of my background in research, I thought that going into uh, San Antonio would be one of the first places. Mm -hmm. So I had that choice as number one, that I wanted to go into some bases in the north as number, number two, and three, and four. Well, when I got my orders, I found out that I was detailed to Anchorage, Alaska. You, you didn't and say, I, you didn't just tell him you wanted to go to the north, <laughs> did you? <laughs> well, when I got that, uh, I, didn't, I didn't believe it. <laughs> but when I looked at the orders again, it, this is exactly what it said. And of course, all of the persons, all of my friends who knew absolutely nothing about Alaska were telling me how I was going to have to be living in igloos. And <laughs> it was just the most awful thing. Well, I can tell you that the two years that I spent with the Air Force in Anchorage, Alaska, were two of the finest years in my life. 
they sold me on the military and as a matter of fact uh, at the end of that time I decided that I wanted to have a, a reserve appointment with the Air Force uh, and have continued it and just uh, retired in 1979 after 24 years service. I really was uh, very very impressed very impressed mm. with not only with Alaska but the organization of the Air Force and uh, the, 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 the carrying out of medical, dental and hospital mm. services for uh, the military personnel and their families. And I, 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 I have a very fond recollection of my two years of experience there. My wife and boy just enjoyed it thoroughly. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and you went up there then as, as a staff? I went up there as a periodontist, chief periodontist, and also as the uh, consultant in periodontics for the entire Alaskan Air Command. Uh, I had taken my boards in uh, perio and oral medicine and uh, uh, because of that was, was given this particular uh, assignment. Uh, I happened to be uh, a very good friend of the, of the colonel, the base dental surgeon, who also, uh, because of my background in education, appointed me as chief of educational seminars. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to uh, establish the first element of clinic day, for instance. Uh, in which we again utilized outstanding individuals to do some lecturing and in-service education and all the rest of it. We also established a residency program whereby some of the young officers who were coming up to Alaska could rotate through uh, oral surgery and perio and prosthodontics. And uh, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed and my association. With all the teasing about polar bears that's and right. seals. And <laughs> that's right. That's right. It was really <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and then, uh, so you took those two years out of your VA career. That's right. To go into the military and then returned to Tuskegee. Returned back as, as chief of the Little Surface. That's right. And because since, since it was uh, in the federal, it was an uninterrupted period oh, of time to his retirement, you see. What prompted you to leave Tuskegee? Well, I left Tuskegee in 1965. 1965. Uh, uh, there were changes that were occurring in the South at that time, and an attempt was made to uh, have the outstanding physicians and dentists and so forth in Tuskegee, which at that time had been completely segregated to try to move them out to various hospitals, you know, to try to integrate the Veterans Administration. After all, this mm -hmm. was a federal agency. And it was absolutely essential to bring more white individuals mm -hmm. in to the staff at Tuskegee and to move some of the staff members at Tuskegee into some of these other hospitals. Until that time, the, the staff at Tuskegee was all black? Was black, yes. I yes. see. Yes. And this yes. is until 1965? 65. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yes. So uh, at that time, the assistant chief medical director for dentistry was another good friend of mine, a Dr. Jerome Hineker, Jerry Hineker. And uh, Jerry was responsible for making the position at uh, the VA Research Hospital in Chicago available. So I went up there as chief of the dental service. And that was like going home for you. That's right. That's yes. right. Back to Chicago. Right. Back to Chicago. Yes. Um, where in, in this period of time did the did your interest in history, um, history of dentistry, start to occur? <coughs> well, I had really and truly always been uh, 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 interested in, in dental history. As a matter of fact, in my final year at Meharry, I had started uh, a small book which was published later on, and the title of that was The Growth and Development of the Negro in dentistry in the United States. Hmm. Uh, I, in the same year, in 52, I had been appointed also the editor of the, the bulletin of the National Dental Association. As you know full well that, uh, uh, again, this was a time hmm. when there was the separate system. And black dentists could not become members of the American Dental Association in the South. And uh, in an effort to organize uh, black dentists, the National Dental Association was formed and uh, uh, it existed separately from the American Dental Association and there were cordial relationships between the two organizations. 
Well, uh, in 1953, pardon me, in 1953, I was appointed the editor of the, the, the journal of the National Dental Association. And uh, uh, because of my association with uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis, who had been uh, editor before me and was also quite a, a historian, I decided to carry on uh, Steve's work following his death. And uh, there was so very little that had been written about uh, what blacks were doing, what blacks were doing in the field of dentistry, that I found there's a very, very fertile field. So we started off uh, by writing short biographies of outstanding uh, uh, black dentists. And that grew and grew until we decided to uh, uh, write some more books about uh, blacks in general, and then specifically the, the, the book on Bentley. Yes, we're going to come back to Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of things to ask you about Bentley. Yes. Oh, that's it. And so you, you began with collaborating with, with Stephen with Lewis. With Stephen Lewis, that's oh, right. I see. That's right. And then mm -hmm. continued his work and your that's work right. in, in that area. That's right. Isn't that fascinating? Because Stephen Lewis was, was a contributor, was one of the contributors to my book on the growth and development of the Negro in dentistry. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, at, at this point, you're now in Chicago as, as chief of the dental service at the... At the VA Research, Research. Hospital. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is now... Uh, the VA Lakeside. Lakeside. Lakeside, uh-huh. Um, and yet you didn't stay there. No, no, no. At the... After I had been there for, um, for about, uh, about a year, the dean of the University of Southern California, John Ingle, Mm -hmm. John was a classmate of mine at Northwestern. And John uh, made three trips to Chicago to see me to invite me to come on the faculty of the University of Southern California and also to be responsible for starting one of the first neighborhood health centers in California. Mm -hmm. As you remember, they had had the Watts riots in 1964, 65. Right. And out of that, uh, the overtures had been made by the University of Southern California to start a neighborhood health center in Watts. Uh, this was an attempt to improve racial relations, interracial relations, and also uh, as, a, as a means of carrying out the matter of availability and accessibility of health services in the communities that didn't have such services. In Watts, prior to the establishment of this neighborhood health center, individuals who needed hospital and clinic care had to go all the way to the county hospital, which was miles away. Now, this was getting started out of USC. That's right. Now that's interesting. That's the private school. That's in, a private school, and but not UCLA. Not not UCLA. No, huh. a private school. And what had happened was uh, that one a protocol had been written uh, uh, to the by I should say by Dr. Elsie Georgie uh, with the uh, approval and cooperation of the dean of the medical school at USC, and it was written to the Office of Economic Opportunity asking for a grant to start a health I center see. in the Watts area. Right. And this money was approved, and so with the, under the aegis of the University of Southern California, this center was started in Watts. And John Engel wanted me to be the dental director of that center. So I was able to get a leave of absence from the Veterans Administration to start this center in I Watts. See. So I left Chicago and came out to California and uh, 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 started oh. the dental section of this. And I'd been there for uh, a year, and again, our um, uh, dental service happened to uh, 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 be a little ahead of the, of the other uh, medical services, and uh, I was under the impression that uh, uh, there was there was a great deal of feeling of uh, of support from the powers that be in on mm -hmm. what we had been able to do in dentistry, so that uh, when the 
the what was called the associate project mm -hmm. director. Uh, when he moved, he was a faculty member at in the medical school at USC. And when he moved on up and out, I was asked to be the director of the entire health center. And this was the first time again that a dentist had been put in charge of a, of a health center. And I stayed, I, I did that for another year and then uh, moved on on a full-time basis, resigned from the VA and went on a full-time basis at the University of Southern California. As you can well imagine that uh, uh, the, the, the situation in the Watts area was, uh, uh, it was a tense situation and I felt very strongly that after one had worked in that area for a period of time and had done whatever one could do to improve mm -hmm. the services, then there came a time when one should, should move on, you know, and give mm -hmm. somebody else an, a, a chance to, to uh, uh, see what he could do. And so I resigned from the uh, center in 1968 and went on a full-time basis to the University of Southern California. And what was your position there? What? At the University of Southern California? Yes. I came on as professor and chairman of the Department of Community Dentistry, which USC did not have before. Uh -huh. So I inaugurated the Department of Community Dentistry and was also an assistant dean. Mm -hmm. How did, um, how did USC or the, the nation's dental schools start to define community dentistry at that time? That was a relatively new kind of department. Yes, we were, yes. and we were actually in the process of uh, delineating exactly what was involved in community dentistry. Uh, we, we made a slight uh, adjustment to some of the, the general concepts of, of public health dentistry. Some and the feeling was really that there was, the dentistry had a responsibility to take care of the health needs of all the people, all the people, which would include those that were poor, those that were very well mm -hmm. able to take care of themselves, and also this large uh, middle income group. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was the responsibility of the dental profession to see that their health needs were taken care of. Uh, we've always made a great deal uh, about the, the, the phrase, you know, that health care is a right. Uh, I have modified that and I've always felt that the access to dental health care was a right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the uh, construction of neighborhood health centers allowed uh, uh, people in certain communities to take advantage of that access to health care. Mm. Uh, as you probably know that at the time uh, that concept of health care being a right, it sort of split the American population into uh, competing groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there were some that uh, firmly believed in that statement and tried to put it into effect. And of course, there were others who felt strongly that um, uh, this, was not, this was not a philosophy that should be uh, fully supported. That somehow you took away from individuals the responsibility to take care of their own health when you indicated to them that they had a right to health care, whether or not they were able mm. to pay for it. And of course, I have been thoroughly involved in many of the uh, dissenting points of view, and uh, at times my head has been bloody. <laughs> but nevertheless, we managed. <laughs> yes, we managed. Wasn't to for the first time. Uh, no, that's the truth. <laughs> um, let me let me ask you now about um, Charles Edward Bentley, <laughs> and as we talked about. Uh, just earlier, this is a, a book that's, that's come out just recently, a yes. book that you and your wife wrote on yes. Charles Edwin Bentley, A Model for All Times. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I went through it really, really carefully just to, to, and found it just a fascinating story of, of not yeah. only Bentley but uh, American dentistry. Um, and now that we've talked this time, some things just occurred to me that I'd like to ask mm -hmm. you about. Mm -hmm. um, in some way, I, 
uh, it seems almost as if um, Bentley has been a model for you. Yes. Yes, I will agree with that uh, 100 percent. As a matter of fact, uh, let's capsulize it this way. I think the, the, the thing that makes me admire Bentley a great deal was his insistence on pulling his weight. He never asked any quarter and never gave any. And at a time when uh, racial distinctions were as rife as they were, I think that this is a, 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 a particularly good lesson that needs to be followed today. Uh, I honestly feel that uh, uh, this business of, of making allowances for deficiencies is a way of prolonging feelings that uh, 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 contribute to the inferiority superiority myth. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, Bentley has, for instance, let's take a, a, a good example. Bentley never believed that uh, he should become uh, a member of a so-called minority professional group. Hmm. He never was affiliated with the National Dental Association. He never joined a minority dental group. Uh, he always insisted that uh, even though circumstances might not be the best from a social stand standpoint. He felt that participating in organized dentistry at the highest level, that was the way to go. And I think that uh, uh, I fully agree with that uh, particular concept, even though I do fully understand the reasons mm -hmm. for the National Dental Association when mm -hmm. it was formed. Uh, I still think that Bentley's attitude, and of course the things that he was able to do, uh, the things that we're talking about mm. now insofar mm. as community dentistry is concerned, yeah. the importance of s the publicity, the importance of, of the social worker mm. and social uh, sociology in dentistry, all of these were things that Bentley espoused mm. way back. And I thought that mm. the fact that this man's basic work had not been recognized, this was the prime reason why I thought it was essential to document, and I say document completely and fully, why he was regarded really and truly as the father of the whole His, his prime were, was during which years? The oh, early but 1900s. His, his birth was 1859. Yeah. Uh, he graduated in 1887. And from 1887 up until his death in 1929, he was centrally involved in mm. uh, 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 making dentistry to be an, an appreciated health service. Mm -hmm. He worked closely with physicians. He insisted on uh, clinics for the poor individuals. Mm -hmm. And this was also very uh, astounding when one stops to think that his practice was on the, 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 the livers of the good life mm -hmm. in Chicago. Uh, among his patients, uh, we have it on, on some evidence that Clarence Darrow was one of his That's patients. Right. Yes, you see. So that um, uh, I think this is the ideal to be able to do uh, a quality of services that, were, that uh, was appreciated by the, the, the livers of the good life in mm -hmm. Chicago, and it's still at the same time, still be concerned about services being rendered to those lesser individuals who are not able to pay for it. Well, well, I, I saw lots of parallels through here. The, the fact that you both went to school in Chicago. Yes. I mean, you, you didn't choose the Howard or the Meharry, yes. but, but went mm -hmm. to Chicago. Uh, mm -hmm. It's interesting that you should bring that up, too, for the simple reason that, uh, and this is an aside, when I decided to make the move to Northwestern University, uh, and had been accepted, uh, one of my first conferences was with the, the, the dean of the dental school at that time, was uh, Dr. Charles West Freeman. Uh, and uh, Dr. Freeman wanted to have a conference with me, and we sat down and we talked. 
and he mentioned to me that um, uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, maybe I did not know it, but at that time there was a large contingent of students. Northwestern had a large mm -hmm. contingent of students from the South, and because of the racial relations that existed at mm -hmm. that time, uh, he wondered whether or not uh, I would not care to uh, uh, go to a so-called uh, colored school. And of course, those were the days when I was very uh, young and uh, impetuous, and uh, uh, there was no hesitation in my uh, indicating to Dr. Mm -hmm. Freeman that uh, I really didn't uh, appreciate advice on where to go uh, when I had made up my mind that my father was in a position to take care of all of mm -hmm. the expenses and so forth and so on, and that. Uh, really and truly when I wanted some advice on that sort of thing that I certainly would go to dad first and that all that I was interested in was whether or not I was acceptable to Northwestern University and I was obviously so uh, uh, I would be going to school there and that was it and you know sometimes when I stop and think back on uh, uh, my attitude at that time uh, I, 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 I marvel at my forthrightness because you know, <laughs> you're just disguising it better now. <laughs> that was certainly not a way to be as a lowly freshman dental student. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, I don't blame Dr. Freeman at all. I think that as a matter of fact, he was really and truly looking out for my interest. And this yes. was the way that things were done at that time. Right. And I really grew to appreciate him. As a matter of fact, he was the one that uh, gave an excellent uh, recommendation to Dr. Clausen and uh, made Dr. Clausen invite me to come down oh. to Meharry uh, uh, to teach. Yeah. We're going to take a little break now. I might be fine. fine. And uh, give a chance to have right. a sip and All right. a little rest fine. for a few That'll seconds. And then <laughs> I, I have a bunch of other things I've been holding in All store right. for you here. All right. <laughs> That's an excellent way to talk. Okay. I'd like to come back to something that, that you talked about before and, and something that I've read in, in, in one of your writings. Um, um, you mentioned before the, your whole sense about um, deficiencies. And, and I want to read to you something that came from the Journal of National Medical Association. And this was something that you were writing about recruitment and retention of minority students oh, to yes. the health professions. Yes. And I just, <coughs> let me just read this and then I'd, I really would like you to tell me a little bit about some of your thinking behind this. It, this is in the, the final paragraph. It says, if in spite of these mutual efforts, students are found to be unfit for careers in dentistry, then in the interest of the health of communities, such students should and must be withdrawn from the particular professional educational programs. Yes, I, I, I fully uh, remember writing that. And I also uh, uh, remember the, the the trials and tribulations that those words precipitated. Uh, I feel very strongly that uh, uh, the best way to help minority students of whatever uh, group, the best way to help them is to recognize where deficiencies are and do what you can to remedy those deficiencies. However, in the end, when you decide that individuals are going to be graduated from institutions, those individuals must fully meet the requirements of the school. In other words, all the deficiencies must be made up beforehand. But when, you put, when a school puts its stamp of approval on a student, that means he has completed all of the requirements and that he is graduating on the same basis as or having fulfilled the same requirements that every other, stu every other student has been uh, asked mm -hmm. or requested to, to, to fulfill. The business of, of bringing students with deficiencies to schools and uh, trying to make up for those deficiencies through the freshman year and then again deficiencies through the sophomore year and again through the junior and senior years and at the end of that time, feeling 
that, well, this student hasn't quite made it, but after all, he spent a great deal of time, and it is for us to, to let him go. I think that is a disservice to the student. I firmly believe that we have, we're going to have, at some time, to make certain rules and regulations, and the students that comply with those rules and regulations and complete them well, those are the ones that are passed on, and those that don't, then uh, they should not be allowed to do a disservice to the profession. Mm -hmm. Now that might sound as being uh, a, a, a rather stringent uh, uh, statement, but uh, uh, you know, like Dr. Bentley, I believe you don't ask for quarters and you don't give any quarters. And if individuals are, are, are not equipped to uh, 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 fulfill the requirements of a, of a profession, then they should not be passed on to the public because mm. you're doing a disservice to the public too. Mm. It, um, let, me, let me read you something from, uh, from Bentley. I, Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is some of your favorite favorite things, but there was something in here that, that struck me that I, I thought was, was really wonderful. Um, and he talks about, uh, in a letter that, he's, that Bentley wrote, and this is back in 1887, and it was soon after he graduated from dental school, yes. um, and it says, truly spoken, we must dig or die, That's no right. dig, no success. Exactly. Success should not attend us unless we dig for it. True success never comes without a pile of digging. Exactly. Now, those are my sentiments, exactly. But you know, uh, uh, that's, not, that's not a sentiment that makes you popular. And uh, uh, Bentley was, was castigated in his time, too, <laughs> by a large number of, of, of persons who attributed all sorts of things uh, uh, to him. But it is in retrospect that one can really appreciate the greatness of the man. And uh, he was... Uh, an individual that uh, could walk and talk with any individual. Uh, he, th that did not mean that he didn't have a sense of, of sympathy and empathy mm -hmm. for those who did not have the advantages and weren't able to, to uh, 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 receive the type of, of uh, training and background that would make them mm -hmm. uh, competitive, so to speak. But uh, having uh, sympathy with getting individuals into that mainstream is, a, is an entirely different thing from the coddling mm. of the unprepared or the mm -hmm. coddling of the uh, 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 of, of deficiencies, mm -hmm. so to speak. How well do you think we've done in, in terms of re recruitment of minorities into the profession? In this, in this country? Yes. <clears throat> oh, I would, I would now, this, of course, is a, is, is, is a personal opinion. I think that we have been making some very good strides and some, some good progress. Uh, where I think we have not been as successful as we could be or should be is in instilling in individuals the feeling of responsibility that they should have to themselves. I see a similarity, I see a parallel with our uh, helping the poor. I firmly believe that our best response is in helping the poor to help themselves. Mm -hmm. And I have the same feeling insofar as the recruitment of minority students. Somehow we have got to to train minority students to do what is necessary to help themselves rather than to be just waiting for individuals to do things for them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think that is really the, 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 the crux of it. Uh, uh, a person who has something done for him really does not quite appreciate mm -hmm what has been done for him, and is likely to look upon it and give it not the value that an individual mm -hmm. gets when he's taught how to do something for himself and then succeeds in doing something for himself. It builds a certain feeling of, of uh, confidence mm 
mm -hmm. a feeling of, of being able to achieve and to perform in oneself. And that's the key. It's a psychological thing. Yes. It's a psychological thing. Um, when, when I go through and, and take a look at, at all of your own achievements as well as the people whose achievements you've documented, I'm wondering if there are some people that um, you think about that um, maybe hasn't been included, say, in this book that, that have had an influence Other on you. Other people minority groups or, or majority or, groups or, as examples. Yes, in, in the profession. In the profession. Yes, 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 yes. And let me, let me quickly add that my, my comments that, are, that, that have just been made uh, uh, should not be confined to individuals of any particular racial, religious, or minority group. I am talking about a, a general situation. The, the, the emphasis on performing, the emphasis on excellence, I think this has to be uh, a nationwide and a, a national uh, 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 function, a national prerequisite, so to speak. And uh, 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 I, I think very strongly that there are individuals in all groups who meet these requirements and can be used as examples to, mm -hmm. to follow. Uh, I think insofar as dentistry particularly is concerned, I think of people like Carl Hillenbrand, who uh, I revere because of his, his emphasis on excellence in dentistry. And of course, as you know, Harold has had uh, his, his problems too. But because his emphasis and his direction was on doing those things that would benefit dentistry, organized dentistry specifically, I think he's, he's gotten to the stage now where there is a sort of a universal approbation. Everybody recognizes him mm -hmm. and everybody recognizes what he has done for dentistry. And you cannot, you cannot equivocate with that sort of thing. See? Now, this applies to, to several other fields. I think uh, in line with uh, Charles Bentley, I'm thinking of one of my, one of my teachers in, in biology when I first came to the United States uh, in 1936. Uh, my first course in biology was taught by a Dr. E. E. Just, mm -hmm. Ernest Everett Just, who was one of the foremost American scientists, not the foremost black American, but foremost American scientist. And his research work on, on cell biology is, is, is known all over the, the, the nation for that matter. I think he was an excellent role model for uh, 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 all scientists, but especially, of course, the black scientist. Uh, he had as one of his associates another uh, young man at that time, a Dr. Hyman Yates Chase, who taught me comparative anatomy. I'm thinking in the line of uh, philosophy, Alain Leroy Locke, uh, in, in music, Hazel Harrison. And for some reason or other, I was very much impressed with Howard because of the fact that they had this large number of really outstanding Americans, outstanding black Americans that were there. And I hmm. was certainly impressed with their emphasis uh, on excellence. At Howard University. At Howard University. And this was way back, you know, in 1936. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved from Howard and went up to uh, Northwestern in Chicago, among my teachers, uh, oh, I think of uh, so many individuals that uh, not only were, were role models for American dentistry, Rudolf Oscar Schlosser, who was professor of prosthodontics at that time and was one of the the, the finest uh, 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 prosthodontic technicians that I've ever known. Uh, Gottfried Lundquist in, 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 in periodontology, mm -hmm. in the basic sciences, Earl Alfred Zaus. I have a great fondness for <coughs> Dr. Zaus, who was professor of physiology, uh, because he was not only a, a good teacher, but a, a, a very good uh, researcher. And in anatomy, Carl Leroy Vey and Macklin Kamens, two wonderful gentlemen who were, who were really and truly role models, and they insisted on your doing, uh, uh, learning anatomy and seeing what the relationships, they were both physicians, but they wanted to impress the relationship that anatomy had uh, general anatomy had to oral anatomy. 
and uh, uh, I, I, I revere them as outstanding teachers. What, what were some of the common threads among these people? Was it the, the insistence on excellence? That's right. That's right. Uh, they, were, they were good teachers. Uh, they, they seemed to be very much interested in their subjects, and they were interested in your acquiring the knowledge that they had. You know, uh, uh, certainly there was, a, there was a strictness present in dental education then that uh, I don't quite see today. Uh, 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 certainly we, we, regarded, we regarded the individuals as not only being strict, but we thought that they were unfeeling, unsympathetic. Well, with the passage of time, I, I, I think that my estimate at that time was wrong. There was an empathy, there was a sympathy with the students, but there was less of a desire to let a student recognize that there was this sympathy because they did not desire to coddle individuals, mm -hmm. which I think in retrospect was not a bad way to be. Of course not. That, that, that doesn't mean that there weren't teachers who enjoyed being difficult, mm -hmm. who enjoyed uh, putting down a student, because you're going to find mm -hmm. this in every school. You still have that today, yep. you yep. see? Many of the teachers at, the, at that time never had any training in pedagogical skills, mm -hmm. so that there was a tendency uh, on the part of some teachers to show off what they could do, and in so doing, failing to teach you how to do it, you mm -hmm. see? But uh, I think with some of the advances that have been made in dental education and the tendency to, to teach teachers how to teach uh, as a part of dental educational uh, 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 philosophy and function, I think that the dental education that is available today, of course, is, is really and truly unparalleled. Of course, we've got different problems, too, yes. and that yes. makes a difference. We, we haven't talked about research yes. too much. And I'd like to, I know that, that when you talked about your life, and uh -huh. teaching, administration, uh -huh. research, and we've kind of talked about two of them, and I, uh -huh. I'd like to hear a little bit about some of your thoughts about um, where uh, research is and where it's going. And uh -huh. Well, I think there, there is absolutely no question about the essentiality of, uh, of faculty members and students engaging in dental research and the, um, the, 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 the role that research plays in the excellence of dental education. I think a school without any research programs is, is just monitoring what has been done and I, I would classify such a school as on the middle level. Mm -hmm. But a school where you have a large number of, uh, of teachers that are, that are intellectually curious I think mm -hmm. this is passed on to students, and it then lifts dental education from the, from the mundane type of activity into something that is responsible for producing individuals who are going to, in turn, be responsible for the success and the excellence and the preeminence of dentistry, education, research, and practice. Now, what has been done in so far as research and dental care is, is, is something that has produced some mm. of the things that we have today. The fact that research, for instance, in the etiology of dental caries and in the prevention of dental caries, that has made, uh, 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 I wouldn't say, I was going to say made restorative and operative dentistry obsolete. Uh, forgive me for <laughs> even saying that because it isn't quite that yet. But we are certainly moving in that direction. We don't have the type of mouths that used to be part and parcel of what came into the clinic when I was a student. Yes. These bummed out mouths with large numbers of uh, dental decay and the necessity for uh, exodontia and so forth and so forth. We don't have that today. And that is the result of what we have found out about uh, not only the, 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 the relationship of fluorine as a uh, caries preventive, but also the better nutrition, the, 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 the better nutrition that uh, we have been able to encourage in people generally. What, what implications do you see that, that those research advances having for the future of dentistry? Where I are see we going? it I see it I see it lessening the incidence 
of certain rampant dental diseases, dental caries, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, by the same token, I certainly hope and see greater emphasis being placed on some of the other dental diseases that uh, having been wrapped up so much in dental caries and periodontal disease, we haven't had a chance to look and to put as much emphasis on some of the other aberrations that occur that affect the oral apparatus. For example? Well, uh, the matter of oral pathological conditions, aphthous ulcers, uh, oral medical problems, the matter of, of, of oral cancer, the infectious diseases that can affect the mouth just as often and just as regularly as they affect other parts of the human body. We haven't really dug, we haven't uh, uh, scratched the surface in some of these things, and we need to. There is one other problem that uh, I see as very important, but uh, uh, <coughs> it, it, it has it has some overtones that may not be uh, pleasant to the average person who spends the time and effort and money in going to dental school. Yes, we've done a good job in reducing certain forms of dental disease in this country. But let's look at the international picture, Doctor. When we look and see the numbers of people throughout the world, underdeveloped nations, where their uh, status in oral diseases uh, is very, very poor indeed. And all of the things that we used to have and don't have today, we find it present in other parts of the world. So that the, there is still a great need mm -hmm. for dental care, basic dental care in other parts of the world. But that would then call for American trained dentists leaving this country and going into Africa and Asia and some of the, 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 the other poor countries of the world and uh, rendering dental services that are not available there. Now you say something like that to our um, uh, dental students and they tell you very definitely that I'm not interested in going anywhere else but here in the United States. Uh, an interesting situation occurred, as a matter of fact, right here uh, in your state, in this state of Oklahoma. Uh, as you know, one of the dental schools that has recently been closed is Oral mm -hmm. Roberts University. And uh, uh, it is my understanding that this university mm -hmm. was built because Mr. Roberts felt very strongly about the rendering of dental care to uh, people in countries that mm -hmm. didn't have access to dental care such as we have in the United States, mm -hmm. and also for dentists going into the poorer areas, the, the, the ghettos and so forth and so on, where care was not available. But because of the fact that of the 100 plus graduates of Oral Roberts University, not one ever found his way either internationally or into the ghettos, uh, it is stated that uh, Mr. Mr. Roberts was a little disappointed and has uh, 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 proceeded to, to, mm. to, to close that uh, particular dental school. Well, <coughs> I certainly uh, 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 would have absolutely no compunctions in insisting that we have got to become much more responsible for oral diseases as they are found throughout the world, it is our responsibility. And as members of the dental profession, people that have been trained in, in caring for these ills, whether or not we do it, it still is basically our responsibility. We cannot shift that responsibility to the physicians or the chiropractors or anybody else. And if we, are not, if we aren't meeting those needs, uh, we have got to sit down and say, well, by heavens, uh, uh, we are lacking in certain areas and we're going to have to find some way of tackling these problems. It, it sounds like a, a theme that, I'm, that I see coming up in a lot of your writings, the, mm -hmm. the, the sense about the responsibility to people. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like to just read from um, your presidential inaugural address when you were president of the International Association uh, of Dental uh, Research. This is back in 1969. Mm -hmm. Um, and you saw as a, there is a leadership role that the IEDR would exert in some of the things we have been discussing, 
And then you go on to say, the fostering and extension of communications between the research hierarchy and consumer deserve the highest possible priority. Yes. As a matter of fact, I would say that uh, uh, the, the IADR, as it is presently constituted, as you remember, at that time, uh, what the situation was, uh, that there was the, the American uh, division mm -hmm. of the International Association of Dental Research. Because at that time, the, the, the IADR really and truly was being financially subsidized mostly by the United States. Uh, uh, we were the leaders of, of dental research, and uh, even though dental research was being accomplished in other countries, uh, uh, they were not given the recognition, the credit for some of the things that they were doing. Uh, since that time, and I, I, I feel very good that we have had a part in stimulating the development of the various uh, countries mm -hmm. on a sort of an equal basis with the United States. Uh, uh, the result has been that dental research has now become an important uh, facet of dentistry in all of the countries, in Europe, mm -hmm. in Asia, uh, the, the Japanese uh, division yes. and so forth, they're all doing, uh, Australian division, they're all doing wonderful, wonderful jobs in furthering the researches yeah. in those countries. The, the world is definitely See? getting right. smaller. Right. right. Um, I wonder if you'd like to take a, a crack at um, something that you wrote. I'll just see how long ago this was now. Uh, this goes back to 1971. This is 14 years ago when you were trying to predict year 2000 for community oh, yes. dentistry. <laughs> I mean, now that you've had 14 years <laughs> closer. Uh, you have, brought all these things back to haunt me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful uh, what you write. Yes. <laughs> What's your sense now, if you were to take a look at now, something that's relatively soon, it's 15 years from now? Um. Well, I really and truly feel that this, this, uh, this busyness problem among our dental practitioners, I think it has the potential, the potential, for a tremendous intra-professional disruption. Mm. It is unfortunate that we have reached through the 60s and the 70s because of the large amount of, uh, not only the, the large amount of, 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 of services that were available to people, but the, 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 the financial rewards that were afforded to dentists in those years, I think those financial rewards spoiled us. In our offices, we had more than enough to do. We had more money uh, coming in from patients. And we grew to, to like it, and our standard of living went very high, and we became accustomed to being in the front line of dental earnings, so to speak. Mm. We didn't recognize, doctors, that that couldn't last forever. And I think with the increase in the numbers of dentists that were being trained and the reduction of the dental work that was required, mm -hmm. we've now gotten to a stage where we have more individuals available to do to perform services when the demand for dental services is not quite equal mm -hmm. to the number of, of, of people that are available. Uh, there is one way of handling that, and I think if we could, and this, I'm afraid, is not going to be popular, but if we could somehow uh, lessen our financial expectations now, to suggest lessening financial expectations to young students who are coming out of school when they have played inordinate amounts of money for that dental education, I don't think that that would be a popular solution by any means. But somehow we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that uh, 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 there is this uh, dichotomy and we are going to have to uh, 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 devise some ways, both the student 
and the, 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 the schools and the dental profession of itself, organized dentistry, we're going to have to devise some ways to deal with the matter of expectations. <laughs> the matter of expectations. Uh, uh, there is no question in my own mind, and of course, uh, possibly I'm saying this because uh, I am not in the front line mm -hmm. of rendering dental care. I'm not a practitioner. And with the practitioners, with the, the, uh, the, the, the bills that are coming in all of mm -hmm. the time, you, you, you have to handle these bills on the basis of the income from patients. Uh, I think we're going to have to think along the lines of, uh, uh, of uh, devising uh, uh, other methods uh, supporting patients to pay for these mm -hmm. services. And this is one of the reasons why uh, 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 the matter of the socialization of the professions, I'm not suggesting this as a as a, as, a, as a final way to go. Mm. But we do need to look into what else can be done from the, f from the standpoint of helping people mm. to pay for services. There's no problem with the persons that are wealthy. They can always mm. pay for their services. There's no problem with usually the poor because there have been up until the the, the, the present administration, there have been subsidies that have been given to poor individuals. But it's this large middle group. Mm -hmm. How are they going to be helped to pay for services? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have the answers for that, doctor. I don't think that many dentists do have the answers for that. Frankly, I don't think that should be our main concern. I think as dentists, we are going to have to utilize the services of the planners, the insurance people, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, attorneys, the, 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 the people in, in, in social work. Those are individuals, uh, the business people. They are the persons, I think, that are going to have to work out how best we mm -hmm. can handle the financial problems of dentistry. Do you, do you see that as the, as the major issue of the year 2000? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I don't see how we can avoid it, mm. because uh, it certainly has been building up over the mm -hmm. past uh, 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 10 years. Mm. And I don't see that we have, we have done what I would classify as an excellent job in handling these problems. We still mm -hmm. have too much dissension within the profession. We still have a matter of, of, of advertising. I have been looking in the, in, the, uh, in the directory, the phone directory, in you know, the classified ads. And when I stop and, and look at uh, uh, what's happening in so far as the advert advertising in dentistry, the, the family dentistry, I see, doctor, a repetition of what used to exist in mm -hmm. advertising 100 years ago. Mm. And all of it not true. There's a good bit of it that's false and misleading, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and this is not to, to, to fail to acknowledge the fact that advertisements have, been, have played a part in bringing individuals that uh, have not been interested in their dental health, bringing them into offices. Uh, many people uh, uh, don't have any knowledge about dental care, don't know where to go. And many of them, have the, the only dental information that they've been able to get has been from these advertisements. See, but it's when these advertisements promise more than they can deliver, when they, 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 they cheapen dentistry by uh, giving you a sort of a laundry list, and uh, when you're using coupons, coupons to, to, to bring individuals into the office, I think somehow that lessens our, our professional mm -hmm. status and, and brings us uh, as near as possible to the charlatan. And that, I feel certainly from an educational standpoint, I can't go along with. 
I, now that you've, I've got you, you're in this <laughs> philosophical mood, um, I, I'd like to ask a, a question that, that essentially you asked rhetorically about, um, about Bentley to kind of talk about yourself. And I, I just want to just, um, um, uh, and you talked about, um, in, you, just reading from this, this postlude that you oh, wrote, yes, it is yes. difficult to isolate the single most important lesson to be learned from the life of Charles Bentley, but certainly his wisdom and attitude in dealing with the protean essence of human beings are prime examples worth our present day consideration. Um, and I'm wondering if you'd like to take a try at talking about what the single most important, important lesson is to be learned from, from Clifton Dummett. Oh, from, from his life. No, no, from <laughs> your life. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I firmly believe that there have been uh, several challenges. Uh, uh, as much as you have heard me say that I have absolutely uh, no regrets over the type of life that I've had, I, I owe so much to dentistry. Uh, uh, if I had to do it over again, it's exactly what I would do. Uh, I love the profession. I think it's made a grand contribution to the lives of, uh, of people generally and certainly to the lives of Americans in particular. Uh, if, I, if I were to come up with a single statement, it would be that you make a goal and then you follow it and you don't allow yourself to be dissuaded or to be uh, uh, shortchanged in the ultimate goal. On your mm -hmm. way to that goal, yes, there are going to be disappointments and there are going to be unsatisfactory situations. But if you feel strongly that as a profession, as a health profession, the dentistry has a contribution to make to the health of the American people, if you feel strongly that we have got to cooperate with other health professions, not fight them, but cooperate with them, not feel second class mm -hmm. to them, because I have no feelings of inferiority uh, to any physician or any other health professional. They have their jobs to do, and we have our jobs to do. And if we do it with excellence, then we have no apology to make to anybody. It is when we uh, begin to become uh, personal, and vindictive in our relationships one to the other, then we lose mm. sight of the main goal, and I think we do ourselves and people a disservice. Uh, I feel strongly that it, so far as the the uh, the 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 the, the r racial and religious differences are concerned, I don't feel in this country that they are a deterrent to individuals who have in mind what they want to do and have the determination to go and do it. That, I think, is the Bentley story. And I subscribe to Bentley's philosophy and his attitude and his performance 100%. It's also the Dummett story. Ah, you're very to say it. No, I feel that strongly. One, one last thing. Uh, we've talked about uh, Clifton Dummett, the, the dentist, the educator, the researcher, the administrator. Um, let's talk for a second about Clifton Dummett, the man. Uh, what are some of the personal things that have been important to you? Oh, I really feel that in those things I, I, I would have to, to really go back and uh, uh, pay a tribute to uh, my immediate family, my wife. She has been uh, such a help over the years and as a matter of fact uh, uh, sometimes I feel she's responsible for uh, uh, my still being alive because I mentioned before as a youngster I, I, I was uh, very impetuous uh, and uh, tended to uh, uh, react uh, sort of shoot, shooting from the hip as we used to say uh, Lois has always been a very intelligent person that has tended to look at things uh, uh, unemotionally, to put things in perspective. 
And very often it, was, it is because of her advice and her guidance that I really have been able to, to uh, overcome uh, mm -hmm. some hurdles. I think she's passed her uh, disposition and intelligence on to our son. We have one, one son who at the present time actually is professor of uh, pediatric dentistry at uh, LSU in mm -hmm. New Orleans. And I think he's inherited his, his mother's good sense and uh, uh, I think will be able to handle, has handled a large number of situations much better at his young age than I did when I was his age. So I think it's with the, 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 the support of the family that uh, uh, I, I, I certainly must uh, uh, give a great deal of credit. In addition to that, I think over the years I have had uh, uh, good support of my co-workers and I have been blessed with a large number of wonderful friends. Uh, I have mentioned some of them here. I shall always be indebted to a person like uh, Don Clausen and Harold Hillenbrand and Joseph Volker and Brian East and I could go on and on and on. Uh, in any calling, any profession, vocation or what have you, unless you are able to respect people uh, respect your friends, demand a certain amount of respect mm -hmm. uh, from them, yes, but to respect and treat every individual the way that you would want yourself to be treated. Unless you do that, mm -hmm. I really feel that you are uh, not on the right road. But if you follow those things, I think that um, life in this country is still really and truly the best in the world. And I could speak of that from experience. I don't think I could have had the same opportunities to progress in dentistry in any other country as I've had in the United States. It sounds like you've answered the question about the lesson to be learned from the life of Clifton Dummett. Ah, you're very kind to see that. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you very much. It's, <laughs> it's been wonderful. Thanks again. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs>